What a blessed day it is to come together with one mind and one heart to sing about Christ and also a God who daily bears our burdens. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us turn to Acts chapter 26, 19 to 32. Acts chapter 26, 19 through 32. Uh, while uh, uh, everybody turns there, let me just give a quick summary of where we are. Um, Paul is in Caesarea. He's uh, chained and imprisoned for over two years by Antonius Felix. And Antonius Felix is a Roman uh, procurator and uh, in the region of J uh, Judea. And these procurators... They took care of the financial affairs. They, uh, they also had some legal authority to hear cases and to uh, send it upward to Caesar. But Felix being corrupt, he leaves Paul uh, behind when he changes office and, and gives the, in the hands of Portius Festus. So Paul is kind of like a, a leftover from Felix. And Portius Festus is new to the situation. Um, Paul, uh, Festus knows this much is that from, the, from hearing about the case that Paul is innocent of all the charges, but he also understands the political situation, that, um, that there's a political sensitivity to this whole situation. And he doesn't want to release uh, uh, Paul because it will make the Jewish leaders very unhappy. So uh, knowing the situation, uh, he... Uh, to please the Jews, he gives uh, Paul the option of going back to uh, Jerusalem to try his case there. But Paul being, as we had talked about in previous messages, just being a very smart person, knowing the situation himself, knew that going back to Jerusalem uh, is not where the Lord wants him to go. The Lord has told him and encouraged him that he's going to go to Rome. So Paul says, no, I want to appeal my case to Caesar. So Festus says uh, that, uh, he declares, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. And in, this is all I'm talking about in chapter 25. So after a few days, King Agrippa II and his sister Bernice, they come to greet this new procurator, uh, Festus. And, so, and then we see a conversation between, the, between them in Acts chapter 25. And King Agrippa, as uh, Minu talked about last week, he... Uh, I mean, essentially, he's a puppet ruler uh, appointed by Rome in this region of Judea. And, and uh, he, he has, he's there because he has a good relationship with Caesar. And last week, we heard about the lineage of Herods and how they're the Edomites. They're the descendants of Esau, but they're also Jewish converts. They, uh, you know, we're not sure how faithful they are as Jews practicing Judaism, but at least they had a general idea about uh, what Judaism was all about. So Festus, uh, in knowing that Agrippa and Bernice were coming, he decides to take the opportunity to introduce this case of Paul to them and get their take, especially Agrippa's take on the case. Uh, and because Agrippa has a better idea of Judaism and the, he has a better uh, idea of the pulse of the, the region, so and, and Festus didn't want to uh, send Paul to Caesar without any kind of uh, valid, um, you know, write-up. You know, he, he didn't want to leave uh, Paul empty, uh, uh, send Paul empty-handed without any kind of charges against him. So Festus said, hey, uh, since you're here, let me bring Paul to you and let him uh, appeal, it, let him present his case to you. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, and so King Agrippa and Bernice, uh, they arrive in this court with great pomp and circumstance. Festus gives an introduction. Uh, and then uh, in the beginning of Acts chapter 26, where we are, uh, Agrippa gives Paul uh, the floor and allows Paul to give his defense. And as we read through 26, we see that Paul is very detailed and respectful and elo eloquent in his presentation. And, and the whole defense is in that first several verses in Acts 26. So now let's read the, the tail end of his defense because of the lack of time. Uh, from 19 onwards, I'll read here. Acts 26, 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not obedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, 
and throughout the whole region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying both to the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So if we, uh, you know, if I, if I had read from the beginning, um, you would have seen that Paul's whole defense is divided into three parts. In verses 1 through 11, he talks about his pre-Christian life. He, he introduces who he was. And then he go, and in verses 12 to 18, he, goes from, he talks about his conversion experience. And then verses 19 to 23, we just read, talks about his post-conversion and his Christian ministry. So while Paul is making this legal defense uh, for himself, he's also intentionally sharing the gospel in the process. This is, this is not unintentional by Paul. And in, in this gospel presentation, he's incorporating his testimony as this raging, mad persecutor of the church and who turns 180 degrees in the direction, uh, uh, 180 degrees uh, after encountering the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. So what we can take from this is that our testimony of encountering Christ matters in our gospel presentation. You can share your distinct experience of your life being turned around, whether it's from sin and darkness to where you are in the light, where you are freed and set freed from many things in the, from the past. You can share an experience of your prayers being answered by the Lord or experience the love of Christ that, uh, that, that has overwhelmed your soul. All these things, makes that our testimony makes the gospel presentation more, more practical and more real. But at the same time, the effectiveness of sharing the gospel comes by the help of the Holy Spirit. Our testimony doesn't make it more effective, but it, it makes it more real. It makes it easier to reason with. And so our gospel presentation, is, it's not, it should not just be a template. It should not just be a canned message. We're sharing a life-giving, a transformative, a real message that can bring people out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Hallelujah. So Paul says one more thing that for us to, you know, to, that who, those of us who share the gospel and, and want to share the gospel need to hear. He says in verse 22, To this day I have had the help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying both to the small and great. It is not our eloquence, it is not our skill that may, helps us to become faithful evangelists. It is the help that comes from God which enables us to become help, faithful messengers of the gospel. The gospel is for the small and the great. The gospel is for the downtrodden and the powerful. The gospel is for the poor and the rich, for the sufferers and the non-sufferers. And God will help us become the messenger of the gospel to everyone. It must be in the humor of God to bring Indian people to the United States to make us into becoming these messengers of the gospel to Americans. I mean, it is, a, it is kind of a joke in of itself because of all the different weaknesses that we have as immigrants, all the different challenges that we have. Our heart language is not English, you know, to speak from the heart. But yet God uses all those weaknesses to make us, and give us that special help to make us effective messengers of the gospel. And, and let's go to verse uh, 24. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent, excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. Paul gets a couple of interesting responses from his detailed gospel presentation. I mean, first of all, Paul's dramatic conversion is being noticed by Festus. And, you know, Festus is probably bothered by Paul. And I just remind you, Festus is not Jew. He is a Roman, uh, and, 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 and he, he probably doesn't believe in anything. He's bothered that Paul is saying that this Jewish Messiah, who the Jews have been waiting for, is also the Savior of Gentiles also. 
This is no longer just a Jewish issue. This is no longer for, for the Romans to say, yeah, that's your problem. If you think you have a Savior in your midst, okay, that's your problem. But when Paul introduces the gospel and, and talks about Jesus being the light, not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles also, Festus thinks that this, this is absolutely crazy. So it forces Festus to personally respond to this message. And so Festus says with a loud voice, it says, he interrupts Paul's defense and he's saying, Paul, you're out of your mind. It's your, your great learning. You're studying too much. You're reading too much. And this is driving you out of your mind. And this is a common response when we, when we share the gospel with zeal and at most sincerity and passion. People will, might say, yeah, you're taking this too seriously. You're taking Christianity too seriously. Or, hey, you got to be more moderate and more balanced when it comes to these things. You know, or, you know, I respect your zeal, but I don't wear religion on my, uh, my sleeve like you do. Well, you know, Festus in this case, is, he's more blunt than most of the people that we talk to. He, he's, he's, you know, and, and he's calling Paul crazy. I don't know how many of us have heard that. But if people were more honest, like Festus, they may say the same thing as well, that we are fanatic, that we are, we are crazy, that we are unhinged. And Paul says in return, verse 25, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent, excellent Festus. I'm speaking true and rational words. So there are a few things to, to talk about from here. First thing, the words, when I was thinking about this, the, the, Paul's words to Timothy comes to mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. When the spirit of God comes upon a person, they're given the soundness of mind. They're given a certain seriousness. And, but, but unfortunately, sometimes in some circles they're taught, where people are taught, that when you're filled in the spirit, it requires turning off your mind. It requires acting uncontrolled. But when... Luke describes individuals being filled in the spirit like the apostles and evangelists like Stephen. They're speaking with boldness. There's an extra boldness that the spirit is giving them. And they, they, they have deep insight in the scriptures. They're getting the exact words to speak. And they're very much in control of themselves. And, and, and they're thinking and acting clearly, clearly. Second, Paul says he's speaking true and rational words. You have to know that Christianity is true and rational. The gospel is true and the gospel is rational. The gospel is simple enough for a child to understand and, and complex enough for a scholar to deeply study for all their life. This is, this is why the gospel is special. So God does not just ask us to turn off our brains when we accept Christ. In, a, in, the, in the scriptures it says... Come, let us reason together. And we see the apostles, especially Paul, reasoning with unbelievers regarding the gospel. God wants us to think through the claims of Christianity. He wants us to think deeply about the problems and the, and the, the questions in life and how that matches in, in light of Christ. At the same time, while we are encouraged to think, we're not going to solve every problem with, with our minds as well. Like we, we, we are limited in understanding and while we can process the basic claims of Christ, we're, we must hold certain things as mystery. We're not going to be able to explain every little minute detail that happens, especially when it comes to suffering and other the things that we see around us. There's, not, there's, no, there's no answer to a lot of things. And I, this is something I've been learning is like you don't have to have an answer to everything. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know to certain things. While we are on the topic of Christianity being true, I, I felt like I, I should talk about one reason why Christianity is true. Um, and, and let me say that the Christianity is true because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is proven to be an actual historical event. Now, we have been covering this topic over and over in, in recent messages, but it's, it's often been from a theological or biblical perspective. Like, you know, what is the biblical significance of the resurrection of Christ? But let me just take a little bit of time. It, it, it's going to sound a little bit academic, but I think it will be beneficial, especially for those of you who are learning and want to learn about um, 
about the, 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 the veracity of Christianity, let me explain historically why it is reasonable to believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. There are five reasons, at least from uh, what I could learn. One, we, we have to know that Jesus predicted his own resurrection. We see in the gospel accounts, Jesus telling the disciples and the general crowd in veiled and sometimes clear language that he'll be raised on the third day. So this was not a surprise to the disciples, but we can see over and over that they did not believe. Or their minds did not, their hearts and minds did not, uh, uh, was closed to understanding what Jesus was saying. But they knew Jesus said it. And even Jesus' enemies knew that this could happen. And, and so this leads to my second point, is that preparations were made by the Romans or Jewish leaders to prevent the body of Jesus from going missing. As we know, what happened? They put a, they sealed the, the, the tomb. The, 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 when the stone was rolled or the rock was rolled against the tomb, they sealed it with a special sealant. They kept soldiers at bay uh, 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 in front of the tomb just so that no one would go in and steal the body of Christ. And so we know that a, a huge event happens and, and, the, and the, the, the Roman soldiers um, are stunned by this. And so the Roman soldiers, in a sense, became the first eyewitnesses to some event. And we know that from, to save their own skin, the Jewish leaders and others sent fake news. This is the first instance of fake news. They said, let people know that the body of Christ was stolen by the disciples. Over the course, uh, uh, you know, over the course of years since then, you know, many have tried to find this tomb of Christ to disprove Christianity. But there, only re there remains one tomb that is emptied and remains that way. It is the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where Jesus was laid for three days. Number three, the resurrection story cannot be made up because the narrative would have been more cleaned up to make it more believable. And here's what I mean. One of the things that we know from the resurrection account is that the first eyewitness to the resurrection was a woman. It was Mary, Mary Magdalene. And so in any case, if you're looking at it from a, another perspective, if someone were wanting to invent the story, the last person they would have be the first witness would be a woman. And that is because in that cultural context, the, the testimony of women were not trusted. They were not considered educated or reliable enough to provide factual evidence. So if it was to be invented, they probably would have had a, a senior Roman soldier or a, a officer or a, or a Jewish leader or someone of prominence. They would have made up something like that. And second, the, the disciples themselves disbelieved or they demanded evidence. We know the sto story of Thomas. We call him Do Doubting Thomas. He said, I will not believe until I touch the wounds of Christ, until I see Christ face to face. He would not believe the, 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 uh, the eyewitness account of the fellow disciples that he was with. And so what do we see? Christ in his, in his kindness appears before Thomas and says, touch my wounds. And number four, Paul says that over 500 or 600, up to 500 people or more than 500 people were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ, or the resurrected Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the, disciples, all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So it is one thing to say, well, yeah, one person hallucinated and, and, and saw, uh, you know, Christ risen. Or two people just happened to see Christ risen. But there's, there's over 500 eyewitnesses. And at the time that was written, there were people that were still living to attest to this fact. That the, and, and so to coordinate the stories of 500, 600 people is not easy. If we were to try to make up a story. To make up the story... It takes a lot of effort. That's what I'm trying to say. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to argue from another perspective of, of a skeptic. So it cannot be explained away by some hallucinations or a psychological phenomena. 
And lastly, most significant reason why Christianity is true and why the resurrection is a historical event is the, is the numerous accounts of life transformation of people after seeing the resurrected Christ. And as we discussed earlier, the, 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 the testimonies of the disciples and those who followed the, followed the disciples cannot be denied. What do we know about the disciples? They were fearful in the days uh, uh, after the crucifixion and, and, and while, the, while Jesus was arrested, they, were, they fled, right? They fled. Peter, the leader of the disciples, denied Jesus three times. But then 50 days after that event, on the day of Pentecost, the same Peter, the same disciples who were hiding and fearing death, they came out in full force, proclaiming that Jesus died for the sins of humanity, that he was risen from the dead, and everyone should believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And not only that, it's not just empty claims. that They, were, they put their lives on the line. They, per, they were persecuted. They took lashes, and then some even died. Some were killed for this. Why would you die for something you, you, you made up? And Paul, we discussed earlier, and this is the most dramatic evidence, I would say, is he was a chief persecutor of the church. He was the person going house to house, dragging people out. Even, even Paul says here in, in, in chapter 26 that he, he tried to uh, make them blaspheme the name of Christ, to, to try to change their minds, to force them to change their, their beliefs. That Paul, while going to Damascus to rout out more Christians, his life was completely transformed by the appearance of Christ. That enemy of Christ, Saul, became the most prominent church planner in Asia Minor. He became the best defender of Christianity at that time. And he aggressively shared the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He became the author of most of the New Testament. So, I mean, I was just highlighting the resurrection of Christ alone. And, and so this is a vast area of study, apologetics. And I, I, I uh, encourage those who are curious to, to look in these things uh, as time allows. But uh, let us move forward. Verse 26. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time you would persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether it's short or long, I would to God that not only you, but all, also all who hear me this day might be we might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king arose, and the governor, and the Bernice, and all that were sitting with them. And when he, they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. As we read earlier, Festus interrupts Paul, Paul's defense. And in this presentation, Paul shifts his focus back to King Agrippa. It almost seems like Paul is sensing that Agrippa is close to understanding the gospel. This also might be because Paul knows that this is the last time he's going to see everybody there, including Agrippa. So he asks Agrippa, he's, he's trying to persuade him to think. He's saying, Do I know that you believe in these Jewish prophets, don't you see the connection of these Jewish prophets? Don't you see a, the fulfillment of that, that these Jewish prophecies are coming true in light of Christ? But then you can see Agrippa slipping out of that question, not, not entertaining to give an answer. And this is kind of common. Like many, you know, many refuse to, to succumb to, uh, uh, to the gospel. They, 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 they're resistant and so Agrippa's response is, are you trying to make me a Christian in such a short time? Short time? And with this, uh, you know, I mean, that it's a kind of a sarcastic answer. So Paul's last line to everybody in the court is that whether it's short or long, I would, I would wish to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day would become such as I am, except for these chains. So Paul is saying it's not in the length or in the quickness of understanding the gospel. It is about life transformation. It could happen quickly. It can happen over a course of time. And Paul also, when he says, 
this day, uh, you know, that you might become such as I am, it reminded me of what he said to the Corinthian church, right? That imitate me as I imitate Christ. Or, and he says also, to follow my example. And in our days, Christians like to say, you know what, don't, don't imitate me, you know? Look at Jesus. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Don't look at how I live my life. Look at Jesus. But what, but what that does is it, reveal, it re- relieves us from the responsibility of being a living testimony of this risen Christ. We are called to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Our, our reaction and our life story in reaction to the gospel brings credibility to the gospel. If we are living hypocritical lives, if we are not living in, right, in step with the gospel, what right do we have to tell others to hear the gospel? And what, what happens, what's happening these days is many are being unfruitful, ineffective in the gospel work because they're not walking in step with the gospel. This is why many are not bold to share the gospel because they feel they're, they're ridden with shame. They're ridden with, uh, they're, they're ridden with sin that they, they feel unworthy to even become a messenger of the gospel. And I'm, I'm going to encourage, I want to encourage each of us this morning to look in our lives, to consider the gospel once again, the, the, the good word of the gospel, and to cling to Christ, to ask, to repent from our sins, and to ask the Holy Spirit to give us boldness, to give us a thirst, and I invite the worship team to come forward, to, to ask the Holy Spirit to give us a sense of uh, a genuine transformation in our life a passion for the gospel a passion to be a witness not only in words but also in action and when Paul says become as I am except for these chains it it reminds us also that being a Christian is not just agreeing to a historical fact being a Christian is also counting the cost. Here's Paul in chains. It's good to say, I, oh, I believe in all the historical claims of Christianity. Oh yeah, yeah I, believe in, I believe in Jesus, but yet not understanding the cost, the cost of discipleship. This truth, it, it is costly. To follow Christ, to die to Christ, to, to follow this gospel, to, the, to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. We heard a testimony this morning. To be known as a Christian in some parts of the world is dangerous. And to, to be faithful to the, the command, the Great Commission, is also dangerous. But that is our call. If Christianity is true, if the claims of Christ are true, we must be faithful to all the claims of Christianity, including the cost of following Christ. And that is why Paul continues on to go to Rome. He could have easily, if his goal was to slip out of this, this prison, he could have done it years ago. And Agrippa is like, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. What is Paul's mission? He is constrained by the Spirit. He's, he's following the voice of the Spirit. And also Christ has appeared to him and said, encouraged him that you're going to go to Rome. And that's our call is that in our Christian walk, in our Christian journey, we need to hear the voice of the Spirit. And regardless of what comes our way, regardless that if that means imprisonment, regardless if that means uh, suffering in our life, we need to have such a closeness in our walk with Christ and, 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 and walk in step of the Spirit to hear the voice of the Spirit so that we can become genuine, sincere messengers of the gospel wherever he leads us. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, O Lord God. In this moment, O God, we pray. Transform us, O Lord God, by the truths of the gospel, Lord. Lord, if there anybody, O God, stuck in sin, O Lord, anybody, O Lord, got stuck in doubt, if anybody's is stuck in the miry clay of this world, O Lord. I pray you'll set them free right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, O Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would infuse, you would fill them with your spirit, O God, this moment, O Lord. Let them fill them with the love of God. Fill them with, O God, your spirit so that they will become bold witnesses of the gospel. When they share the gospel, 
let tears come to their eyes because Lord, their heart, their heart is set free. They can share openly, they can share with joy, knowing that this Christ that I'm sharing is in me. I'm walking with Christ daily. And let that passion come out, O oh Lord God, of all each one of us, O oh Lord. And we pray as Paul, as Paul heard from the Spirit, O oh Lord, I pray that these days from each one of us, that Lord, that you would speak to us and we will hear the voice of the Spirit. We will see, we will hear the voice of Christ through the word and through Lord, through our prayers, O oh Lord. I pray in these days, O oh Lord God, that there will be many people, O oh Lord, stepping out, O oh Lord God, to be faithful witnesses of Christ wherever they are, wherever they're planted, whether they're in the schools, whether they're in their workplaces, Lord, in, the, in their communities, O oh Lord, I pray, in their neighborhoods, Lord, I pray that we would become faithful witnesses of Christ, O oh Lord, that we will count the cost and we will take that cost, O oh Lord, to be, O oh God, the, the, the servants of Christ to the ends of the earth. We give you all the praise, glory, honor, God, for all you have done, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.